welcome back to another episode of the Whiskey Diaries. My name is Martin Lang and today we're going to be talking about Nika whiskey, in particular the single malt Miyayiku whiskey. Now, this is a knowledge statement whiskey and this is very very important because it marks a time in the whiskey history that we're going to be talking about for a while. This is when whiskey started getting run, the old age statement started to run out and around 2014, 2015, so all distilleries started making a knowledge statement. We'll go, we'll go back to that in a sec. But in particular, we're just going to, a little bit of history. Uh, Masataka Taketsuro opened uh, Nikkei Distillery, the first one, in uh, 1934 in the precinct of Hokkaido in, uh, in uh, Yoishi town. Now, Masataka Taketsuru did an apprenticeship in Scotland for about 10 years uh, under the distilleries, at first in Longbourn, and then he moved to Hazelbourne in uh, uh, Campbelltown. Over there, he met a young lady called Rita, and then they got married, and then they moved to Japan together. Now, the relationship between Rita and Taketsuru is actually quite important because this is what sort of changed things in 2014, which we're going to talk about in a second. Anyway, uh, Nika, Nika, the first distillery that they opened was in the South Island, that it was uh, Yoshi Distillery, and that's on the West Coast, so it was actually close to the ocean. In the 1960s, they actually went and they opened, after three years search, they opened a distillery called Miyayiku. Miyayiku was supposed to be one and a half times the size of Yoshi, but eventually it became almost two and a half, three times the size. In, 19, in the 1961, uh, 69, when they opened, uh, they opened at a, uh, 1.5 times, and then in the 70s they did another expansion, and then in the 80s they did another one expansion as, uh, as well, adding column distillations uh, to produce grain whiskey which is really important for blends. Now, the reason why they did this as well is because Japanese has a very particular way of dealing between distilleries. They don't share a lot of information. They definitely don't share the whiskies, uh, unlike the Scottish counterparts. Scot in Scotland, it's very common for distilleries to either do uh, given di different barrels or new make spirits and so on and so on, and they create blends between different distilleries and so on. In Japan, if you want to create a, a blend of whiskey, your distillery itself has to have different types of whiskey to, pr to produce that blend. We have talked about Nika from the barrel, uh, you can watch in some of our videos as well, just to go through all the range of Nika, uh, but basically that's an important fact. Now, Miyayiku in itself uh, produces a really light style of whiskey. Uh, and the reason why they started doing no age statement is because around in 2014, uh, the, um, a Japanese, uh, a very famous TV network released a Japanese soap opera called Masa, that basically is, uh, sorry, Masan, that is basically it's a 15 minute little soap opera that gets released in the mornings. And this one in particular ran for one year and it was the story, the romantic story between Rita and Taketsuru. The reason why their relationship was so important and worth making a movie is because Rita was Scottish and Taketsuru was Japanese. And at that time, that sort of relationship was really frowned upon because of the First World War and the Second World War in which they, won, they both went through. And obviously Japan being an enemy of, of Scotland or the other way around, uh, it was actually quite hard for them. But they stuck together and their romantic story uh, from that TV show actually threw uh, Nika whiskey sales through the roof. So much so that in 2015, the distillery itself, Yoshi, had one million visitors go through it. So Japan started consuming basically all the age statement. And Nika, like many distilleries at the time, didn't think that the whiskey boom was going to be so big. So a lot of distilleries at, this, at that time were running out of age statement. Like I'm, I'm talking everybody, including the big ones like McCallan, started releasing editions of no age statement. So uh, I'm not sure if you remember, but uh, McCallan released uh, the Amber, Sienna and Ruby, uh, that those whiskies did not have any age and they didn't tell you why age it was. I think it was a little bit of correlation and causation in the way that they said the causation that they started releasing uh no statement because of the causation of the fact that they were in running out of stock but i think there was a little bit of correlation on the fact that distilleries at the same time wanted to teach customers how to drink a whiskey without an age on it it's a lot of distilleries that have been doing no age statements for many years like uh Adberg, uh, uh even even lafroy have a lot of no age statements and so and so on and so on but these are big, big, big distilleries that wanted to educate customers in telling them that an age on a bottle doesn't necessarily mean that the whiskey is a, is a, 
is a better whiskey than a no age statement. So they were focusing more on flavors and showing, showcasing the whiskey in itself than just a person focusing on the, on the age. I'm a 50-50 person per so, uh, personally. I do like looking at the label and going like, this is a 21, 18 year old, 15 year old, and so on. Uh, but it does make you a pretty position of judging the whiskey. So like sometimes you might have a 10 year old whiskey and you go, oh, this is only just 10 years old. And it actually is magnificent. Um, so it just, it, it gives you a little bit of predisposition. I know it's statement, you are open for anything, to be honest. You look at the bottle and you go like, oh, this could be anything. And it actually, a lot of the times gives you basically a, a blank canvas into you can just and really enjoy the whiskey. They're both, both, both different versions have different uh, pros and cons. But anyway, in the 2015, they cancel all the age statements, and at the moment, Nika uh, is only doing no age statements, uh, which is the Takatsuro Pure Malt, the Nika Miyayiku Single Malt, the Yoishi Single Malt, and the Nika uh, from the barrel as well. Now, uh, as I said before, uh, this one is really floral, really fruity style of drinks. This is perfect for a highball, so it just uh, goes ice and soda water, uh, or just by itself, 45% ABV. Uh, as I said before in many videos, the, 40, my, the sweet spot I believe is between 45 to 47% ABV for a whiskey. Is that like little extra punch that you get from a 40% ABV whiskey? Most of the times it's a little bit diluted. Um, this one actually carries through. Uh, and the reason, and this is the reason why this whiskey, even though it doesn't have no age, goes quite expensive in the Australian market, going to $130, $140 a bottle, is because of the tax bracket, 45% compared to a 40% ABV. If this whiskey was 40%, that you can probably buy it for a hundred bucks or so on. Australian tax is very, very strict on that sort of stuff. Uh, so anyway, uh, tasting the whiskey in itself. Yeah, that's like that's like drinking water. It's like really, really soft, really, really gentle. It has a green tea, apples, very floral, uh, a little bit of heather and a little bit of honey in the back. Uh, it's purely aged in American oak, so there's a little bit of sweetness at the end. Um, so this is a delicious whiskey. Again, they just, I don't think that Nika produces a really bad whiskey. So uh, there you go, guys. Thank you very much for listening, and hopefully we'll see you next time. Salam